Can we give it up for the worship? Thanks, Brother Nikolai. And last name is Pacino. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Man, one of my favorite actors, but I probably shouldn't admit that at a Christian camp. But anyway, um, so good to see y'all and uh, so good to be with y'all. The theme for the camp this week is Outpost. And I'm hoping that in the series of talks that you received from me uh, this week that we will explore the church as an outpost of the kingdom of God. That, that Christians at the end of the day are not, uh, for the most part, the citizens of any of the nations or governments of this earthly realm, but we are the citizens of the kingdom of God. And, and, and that to, to understand outposts is to understand the church ultimately representing the kingdom of God, an eternal government that will never end. And ultimately, the Christian life is the life of those that are citizens of the kingdom of God. Until such time as Christ returns, that we would be uh, the best representation through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of the kingdom of God. And uh, one of the ways to experience being citizens of the kingdom of God, being collectively the outpost of the kingdom here on earth, is through uh, experiencing the hope, health, and healing of God, and through that, expressing the hope, health, and healing of God to a world that is broken, to a world that is upset. Side down. We will explore that here in the mornings this week. With that in mind, there is a word found in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 32, beginning with verse 24. We're meeting a man named Jacob. Jacob, as we meet him right now, is alone. He is about to meet his older brother, but there's been strife between he and his brother to the point that he's wondering when he meets his brother, will his brother kill him? That's the kind of strife. I mean, they needed family camp. If anybody needed family camp, <laughs> it was the family of Jacob. I mean, his, 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 his daddy and his mama and his, his siblings and his, his, his wives and children. Oh, Lord. They needed family camp in the worst way. So we meet Jacob in the wilderness alone here in Genesis chapter 32, beginning with verse 24. It says, So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, When You Want to Quit on God. Or another more, you know, positive title is Don't Give Up Hope. <laughs> God, I pray this would be your message that ultimately you would be speaking and that, God, I would just be the vessel you've decided to use to say what you want to say to these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers, God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When you want to quit on God, or, or don't give up hope. Yeah. Uh, in 1993, a former college basketball coach, Jimmy Valvano, gave an incredible speech at the ESPY Awards. He received the Arthur Ashe Award of Courage. He had been known for winning a national championship in men's college basketball against all odds when he was the head coach at North Carolina State. But on this night, he spoke before thousands live, millions through television, while his body was riddled with cancer. But yet, in this pain, in this physical brokenness that he was experiencing with a smile on his face, 
He encouraged millions of people to not give up hope, to not quit. And, 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 and it was amazing that in the state that he was in physically, that he had not given up hope. And he was calling the world to not quit, to never give up. He said, don't ever, ever give up. Years before that, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is preaching in Memphis, Tennessee on a stormy night. He didn't know this, but it was on the eve of his assassination. And he preached a sermon that we now call, I've Been to the Mountaintop. And with just, just a rhythmic, powerful cadence, he called that congregation to not give up hope. He didn't know if he would see the ultimate goals of the civil rights movement, but yet he was so hopeful. Uh, Jimmy Valvano, Martin Luther King Jr., I mean, totally different people, speaking from different circumstances, but they were two people who uh, just, just were with one hours from death, the other days from death, but yet so full of hope. In a world that is good at quitting, quitting on careers, quitting on purpose, quitting on commitments, quitting on marriages, quitting on children. In a world that is good at quitting, there is a God that calls us to hope, that calls us to commitment, that calls us to hold on. I mean, you've quit before. I mean, be honest. You, I mean, and you, either you, you were a little kid and somebody put you in a wrestle move and you said, uncle, uncle, are you tapped out? I mean, at some point, you just like, I, and, and you know, sometimes there are good reasons for quitting. I mean, some of you sitting next to your spouse right now, you, you're there because they quit somebody else to find you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Won't he do it? <laughs> some of y'all are better at quitting than others, but I mean, hey. And then sometimes quitting is good to get somebody right. I mean, I don't have to go into the whole thing, you know, now. But my wife, Donisha, we've been married for 31 years. Uh, we started dating in high school. Uh, she broke up with me three times <laughs> before, before we were engaged. And you know what? I can say today, rightly so. Rightly so. I was deserving of being broken up with three times. And so sometimes... Quitting will get you right, get you in your right mind, get you in your right heart, you know, get, get you on the right path. Uh, and, and, and so, so sometimes quitting is wise, but yet for the Christian life to be sustained, it's about holding on to hope. It's about not throwing in the towel. Um, Jacob. Jacob, whose name would be turned to Israel, which would be representative of a nation of chosen people that God would start with, that would then be expanded to God's plan all along, that the world would be reached, that Jews and Gentiles would be reached. But Jacob is known, at least he's introduced to us as a deceiver. He's not only one who deceives others, but he's one that's been deceived. And he's at a moment when we meet him in Genesis chapter 32 where he's wrestling with who he will be moving forward. What will his life be like? What kind of father will he be? What kind of husband will he be? What kind of child will he be? What kind of brother will he be? What kind of friend will he be? How will he live his life? Is there any hope for Jacob? who's been a liar, who's been a deceiver, who's been a manipulator? Is there any hope for Jacob? And in turn, does Jacob have hope for his own life? And when I say hope, I'm talking about a biblically rooted hope. I mean, there's all kinds of hopes. I mean, I hope I'll get married. I hope I'll get a promotion. I hope I'll be healthy. I hope tomorrow will be a better day. I hope that next year will be better than this year. I mean, there's all kinds of hopes, right? Uh, but this, this hope is a biblical hope. It's a godly hope. The hope that I want to present to you is, is a confident expectation and desire for what is to come, a belief that something good will come regardless of our current circumstances. The kind 
of hope that I want to call us to this morning is a hope that begins with hope in God. And out of the overflow of our hope in God, we have a hope for our world. We have a hope for our lives. We have a hope for what is better. We see something on the horizon. We see something into eternity that is greater, that is better better, that is amazing, that is more tremendous than anything I'm experiencing even in this moment, no matter how good or bad it might be. This hope is the belief that ultimately God provides hope for the world, not me. And that any, in any way that I'm providing hope in the world, it's that I'm participating in God's hope for the world. And God's hope for the world is it's, it's victorious. It's sustainable. It will have its way. No matter what is going on in our nation, no matter what is going on in the world, the hope that we have in God cannot be deterred. It cannot be dismantled. It cannot be deconstructed. It cannot be canceled. It cannot be erased away. This is the hope that we should have. A hope in God. A hope that is about what God is doing and God will do in spite of what we experience. And people who quit believing in God have lost hope. But there are people that still believe in God that have lost hope. But maybe they lost hope in God because the hope they had was not truly rooted in God. Maybe their hope was rooted in religion Maybe their hope was simply primarily rooted in the institutional church, which, which I'm all for church, but I'm for who is the head of the church more. Maybe people, they put their hope in a, in a relationship with a human being that said they believed in God, said they loved God, and that didn't work, and that impacted their hope. Hope in God is not a blessing you can steal from your brother, Jacob. You can't even live off other people's hopes. You have to find yours. So Jacob is alone and he's wrestling, trying to find hope. And from Jacob's life, I just want to briefly just think about how to live a hope-filled life. There is so much going on to steal your hope. You, you watch the news too long. It'll, it'll choke your hope. It'll choke the hope out of you if you let it. If you, I mean, what is going on in the world? It can suck. It can drain the joy out of you if you let it. And I'm concerned, sisters and brothers, because God is the hope of the world. And his son, Jesus Christ, and the death and the resurrection is the hope of the world. But also the hope of the world connected to God the Father and God the Son is God the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is living in you, which means that your life in some way ought to be representative of the hope of God in the world. So if Christians are bitter, and angry and unforgiving and unreconciling and divisive all the time. If we are pouring gasoline on the fires of polarization and division and brokenness and bias and separation and anger, then how can we be the very temples of the hope of God in a broken world? You got to get your joy back. You got to get your song back. You got to get your happy back. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how messed up it is. You you got to find your hope. So maybe God sent you here. I, I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm preaching like I'm, like I'm Baptist. I, don't, I didn't know what this was supposed to be. If it was supposed to be a teaching, whatever it is, it's too late now. I'm up here. So I don't care. I don't know where you from, what your ethnicity is, but when I'm up here, all y'all going to be black Baptists this week. All y'all. <laughs> So just find your, find your joy and your chocolate. Because <laughs> that's what it's going to be with me. And my brother Aaron coming later. So you get his, whatever flavor he bringing, you're going to get that too. Okay, what am I supposed to be preaching about? Okay. How to live a hope-filled life. That's what the church should be, shouldn't it? The church should be a community where you walk into it and you find hope. 
hope for today, hope for tomorrow. You come into the church community and you find hope for your marriage. You, you find hope for raising kids. You find hope, again, for having character and integrity. You find hope for living. So how to live a hope-filled life. Point one, recognize your brokenness. Recognize, I know, that's a funny place to start, right? You're trying to find hope. You're trying to find joy. You're, find, you're trying to find meaning. Well, first, you, if you're going to have hope, the first thing you have to do is you have to recognize, acknowledge, be aware of your own brokenness. So in, in Genesis 27, we, we realize that, you know, man, from, from, from an early age, there's been brokenness in the family uh, uh, of Jacob, that, 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 uh, that there, there's been brokenness in the heart of Jacob. And, and it goes back to like this tension between him and his brother. They're twins, but technically Esau came out first. And, and so they're brothers, but Esau's the older one. And, and so there's this, this tension, there's this rivalry between them to, to the point that, that, that J- Jacob is like stealing from his brother. And so he's, he, he's, he steals his birthright. He steals his blessing. And so here we are in Genesis 27 and verse 30, and their father Isaac, he just finished blessing uh, Jacob, giving him a blessing that wasn't his. It was meant for his brother Esau. So verse 30, Genesis 27, after Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed, he, he, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright. Now he's taken my blessing. Then he, then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives, uh, 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 all his, relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, father. Then Esau wept aloud. What, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that there's brokenness in the heart, in the soul of Jacob, but there's brokenness in the family that he comes from. His mother was in on this. So there's something going on that has divided the father, Isaac, and Esau, and the mother, and, 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 the, and, and the brother. I mean, there, there's something here that just reeks. It just, it just shows us brokenness. But this is pointing to a larger brokenness. This is pointing to sin. And sin in the Bible shows up in at least three dimensions. There's sin in the soul. So we see here sin in the heart of Jacob, that on the inside, he is broken. But we also see in the Bible that sin is also in society. So sin, it for sure, it's in the soul of individual human beings. We are all born sinners without intimate relationship with God, without the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On our own, we are sinners, each and every one of us individually. But when you take individuals with sin in their soul, and they start building things. They start building institutions and governments. They start building ideologies. They start building structures. Now you have systemic sin. 
So the, the attempt at building the Tower of Babel, that's systemic sin. Uh, the, the, the Babylonian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, the Medo-Persian uh, Empire, the, the Medo-Grecian Empire. These are all examples. Divided Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, the Roman Empire. These are examples of individuals with sin in their soul constructing things. Now you have sin in society, and then you also have sin in Satan the very embodiment of sin. The good news is that in Jesus Christ, uh, we we can have redeemed souls. Jesus deals with sin in the soul. The good news is one day Jesus will return. And when Jesus returns, uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a new society. So that will deal with systemic sin. And then he will defeat the Leviathan, the dragon, the serpent. Satan will be defeated. So Jesus addresses sin in all three of its dimensions. He addresses sin in the soul, sin in society, sin in in Satan, who are we to be in the meantime as a people of hope? We have to start with acknowledging our brokenness and the brokenness of the world in which we live. All of the world is broken without Jesus, even the best examples of it. I'm so glad that I live in a nation where we can worship Jesus right now in this place with no fear of being arrested. That's awesome. I'm glad that I live in a nation where everybody gets a vote. We ain't talking about that this week, but everybody gets a vote. All right, a democracy. That's awesome. Uh, awesome. I'm also glad I live in a nation where you can take an idea and you can turn the idea into a product or a service and you can take that product or that service and turn it into a business and participate in the free market enterprise. That is so awesome. I, I wouldn't want to live any place else. I'm not moving no place else. You know why? Because I like fried catfish, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, yam, sweet tea, cornbread, peach cobbler, vanilla bean ice cream. I ain't getting that in Paris. So, hey, I'm not moving. I don't know what they serve in the rest of the week here, but I'm just, I'm, just, I'm Southern, it, you know. But, but what I'm trying to say is with all of that awesomeness, it's still not the kingdom of God. I, I, I would be lying to you if I told you the United States of America is the hope of the world. No, Jesus is the hope of the world, and the kingdom that Jesus represents is the hope of the entire world. And one day, no, none of these earthly governments will exist. None of them, even the best expressions of them, when Jesus returns. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to do with all the patriotic flags when Jesus returns. I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> because ultimately, the church is not a representation of its earthly nation. It is an outpost of its eternal kingdom heaven. This is who the church should be. This is who Christians are. I'm so glad I'm here in the United States of America. I I could talk to you about it all day, how glad I am about it, but I am more excited about eternity and so to, to sustain our hope because the greatest expressions of a nation will disappoint you, will suffocate you, will bring grief and sorrow to you. Ah, but not heaven. Uh, Heaven is consistent. The kingdom of God will not disappoint. Jesus will return. And so the best we can do if we're going to live hope-filled lives is to begin with, I'm broken. I I can't even pick on your brokenness because I got my own. And we live in a broken world that is so in need of the redemption, the righteousness, the reconciliation that comes through Jesus Christ. Jacob is broken, but God has not given up on him. So how to live a hope-filled life? Recognize your brokenness, but two, realize God is with you. In Genesis 32, verse 1, it, sa- it says this, Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Why? Why? Why is this important? So Jacob deceived his brother, stole his birthright, stole his blessing, and now he has to leave home because it's not going to work out anymore for he and his own brother to be in the same house. I mean, just think about it. 
Cain killed Abel just because God smiled on Abel's, the fruit of his work. Like, Abel didn't steal Cain's blessing. Abel didn't steal Cain's birthright. All he did was go to work and came home from work and showed God the fruit of his work. And his brother Cain showed God the fruit of his work. And because God, for whatever reason, smiled on Abel's work, Cain was so mad, he killed his brother. So if, if, if a brother would kill his brother over that, I don't know if Esau and Jacob were told that story. But if they were, that'd be enough for me if I was Jacob to say, I'm leaving the house. <laughs> but now, years later, later on in adulthood, Jacob is about to reunite with his brother Esau. And he has no idea what this encounter is going to be like. Will his brother still want to kill him? Will his, will his father and mother receive him again? How will he be treated? He, he's feeling alone and isolated. He is not carrying much hope at this point. And yet the Bible says the angels of God met him. But later in verse 24, where I began this message, it says, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. That sentence don't make no sense. How can you be alone and have somebody with you at the same time? <laughs> it says he was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So what we could take from this verse is that he's alone from the standpoint that a normal human being is not with him. And when you are not deeply connected, in proximity to, socially, emotionally, mentally separated from other human beings, you feel alone. But it doesn't mean you're alone. God's presence is there. How do we sustain hope by not only acknowledging our brokenness, but also being aware of the blessedness that God is still with us no matter what you've done, no matter what you said, no matter what you've been through, no matter what's been done to you, no matter how broken you might feel, no matter how tired you are right now, no matter how much stuff. It's like you are away from home, but yet everything that you would normally be doing today at home is still running through you, ain't it? It's still on your mind. It's still on your heart. It's still causing you to say, did I, need, did I get that done? Did I lock that? Did I put that away? Way? Did I do that? Did we do that? I think we did that. Did I put that on? I thought I did. Did I take care of that? Do I need to call somebody? Is there a reception here? Where's the Wi-Fi? <laughs> All of that because you're separated from. And so being separated from can cause its own anxieties, its own pressures. Even when you're on vacation, even when you're at family camp, even when you're away, even when you've unplugged, it's still running through you. It's still on your mind. It's still weighing on you. And, and, and separation can cause its own pressures. So here is Jacob, separated from his family that he grew up with, the brother that he deceived. But yet, he is not alone. He is not truly isolated. So what are you carrying in this season? What stresses are you carrying? What anxieties are you carrying? What is it that causes you to feel alone even though you live in a house with other people? What is it that causes you to feel like you are not understood, not seen, uh, not 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 paid attention to, alone. The issue is you're never alone, so don't give up. God is with you. God is with you. The hope that we sustain is knowing that you're surrounded. God has been surrounding you all the time. God has been surrounding your situation the whole time. I know it hasn't been easy. There's been ups and downs. There's been mountains and valleys. There's been good days and bad days, but you were never by yourself in any of this. God has been with you. God has been with you. So how to live a hope-filled life? One, 
recognize your brokenness. Two, realize God is with you. Three, wrestle with God as long as it takes. To sustain hope, there are things that you need to include God in the wrestling, in the frustration, in the anger, in the worry. Include God. Let's go back to the text that I started with in this message, Genesis 32, beginning with verse 24. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. This is interesting, sisters and brothers. He's saying you wrestled with humans and you wrestled with God. So you've wrestled with your own family. He even had to wrestle in how he got married. This is where the deceiver was deceived. So when Jacob you know, wants to get married, he goes and works for the man that will become his father-in-law. And, and, he, and he's saying, man, I, I would love to marry your daughter, Rachel. And so he worked seven years so that he could marry her, uh, the daughter and, and, but she has a sister named Leah, and so he's tricked into marrying her first. And yeah, this is where it gets complicated now. This is like, like biblical sister wives. What is this? Hey. Oh, okay. Uh, the, um, <laughs> I, I had a feeling that one wasn't going to go over as good, Nikolai, when I thought of it at first. But I don't know any other way to say it except that's what it was. They're sisters. they both his wives. Hello, come on, y'all got cable. Come on, you, this should not surprise you. So the deceiver's been deceived. I don't know what kind of stress and anxiety and issues he's carrying now, living outside of the framework that God had for marriage, living outside of the original construct that God had for family because he's broken in a broken society which creates broken expressions of marriage and family. And so here he is wrestling with a man that he doesn't know his name. But when he's done wrestling, he realizes that he has wrestled with God and man. This man he's wrestling with won't give up his name. Some people believe this is a pointing to Jesus. Some might go way far and go, is he wrestling with Jesus? Because if he's wrestling with God and man, is this a precursor? Because Jesus is not like Jesus didn't exist before Jesus ex existed as Jesus born the Messiah heading towards the cross. Because in John 1, he said, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. Nothing came into being without him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's him, Jesus, which means Jesus was there even in this moment, even if that's not Jesus. But it points us to Jesus because he's wrestling with someone that is beyond human, but then you go, well, if he's beyond human and he's wrestling with God, how is it that he's winning and he has to get touched in the hip so that the one he's wrestling with gets an advantage in the wrestling? But again, maybe that's a picture of when you're truly God and truly human, we get to see the God of you, but we also get to see the humanness of you, the weakness of you, even though you're without sin. I don't know. All I know is this wrestling is a wrestling that we need today. There are issues that you are wrestling with. Let God in the fight with you. And if you don't, God will step in the fight anyhow. I, Jacob didn't seem to have a choice in this wrestling match. Why not include God in the wrestling? Be real with God. Let God in on your fights. Whoever you're fighting, whatever circumstance you're fighting, whatever future you're fighting, whatever you are fighting, why not let God 
into the fight. So um, I got to confess something to y'all. I hope this don't change your view of me, but um, I watch pro wrestling. Oh, man, I hope, I hope this don't change how you see me this week. But, and and now let me explain why I watch pro wrestling, because it's not my fault. It, it, it's, it is not my fault. So my grandmother on my dad's side, my grandmother on my dad's side, from Louisiana, I would go stay with my grandparents on my dad's side during the summers when I was growing up. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but my dad is from Monroe, Louisiana, and so uh, me and my younger brother Tremaine and my mom and dad, we would drive from Minneapolis. Yes, just drive. I don't know what, they had planes, I don't know, but we, we would drive in a, in a 1978 Oldsmobile, all the way with an eight-track player in it. You explain this to your kids later. And so we'd go down, you know, listening to Earth went in fire in Chicago and the Commodores and the OJs the whole time on eight tracks from Minneapolis from the head from the hat of the United States to the boot of the United States we would go all the way to Louisiana and then they'd stay a couple weeks and then they would leave and me and my younger brother would stay with my grandparents for the summer in Louisiana and my grandmother man she was a woman of God she sang in the choir she taught Sunday school I mean we went to church every Sunday while we were down there but uh, for, and on Sunday, like she was real old school. On Sunday, we couldn't we couldn't watch TV during the day after church. They only listen to gospel music, except the one exception on Sunday. <laughs> for whatever reason, is my grandmother turned wrestling on <laughs> at five o'clock on Sunday. I don't know why. She was like, "Oh Jesus, Jesus! Look at the junkyard dog. I hope he wins." <laughs> Look at Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I mean, look at Hulk Hogan. I don't know why. She's like, was in, like, super into wrestling. So it's so, I, so because of her, I, I just, I still watch pro wrestling. <laughs> Pray for me. So, but this is why I'm telling you this story. Uh, there's like matches. Oh, and it's scripted. So, we, you know, they know already who's going to win and lose. So spoiler. So, uh, but like one expression of wrestling is tag team wrestling. When you're, you're wrestling with somebody, and this is how they get people. They have a good tag team and a bad tag team. And they do this all, I don't know why I've seen this like thousands of times, but I still get into it like I'm seeing this for the first time. It's like the good guy is in the ring and the two bad guys, when the ref's not looking, they're cheating and they're beating up on them and beating up on them and beating up on them. And then the ref turns and they act like they're not doing nothing wrong. And then the ref turns back and they're beating on. And while the, the one good guy is beating the other tag team partner, he can't get in the ring, but all he can do is he has to put his hand out like this and he's like, tag me. Tag me, tag me. And like the crowd's like, tag him, tag him, tag him. And it's like, he tries to get over there. And as soon as he gets there, that bad guy's pulling back. And they're beating on him and beating on him. And the guy's just like, tag me, tag me. And he's trying to get out. He's trying to reach out as far as he possibly can. Tag me, tag me. And then finally, when the guy tags him, like the whole arena erupts. Like my grandmother, like, spilled her root beer float in the air when he tags. She was so excited. And, and I just wonder if there's a situation that you have where God is just going, just tag me. Just, just, tag, just, just tag me. I'm not going to force my way into your ring. God is not going to force his way into the ring of your marriage, into the ring of your parenting, into the ring of your womanhood, into the ring of your manhood, into the ring of your career. But he will show, stretch his hand out to you. He will stretch his hand. His, his fingertips are so close to your situation. Why not tag God? Let God in the fight. Don't wrestle with this anymore alone. So for some of us, we've been, we've been wrestling with this since we were a child. Sisters, you've been wrestling with some of this since you were a girl. Brothers, you've been wrestling with some of this since you were a boy. And you brought it into your teenage years. You brought it into your, your college years, into your career, into your marriage. And God has not stopped saying, tag me, tag me. And the angels will erupt. Just like that wrestling arena when the people go, yes, they were waiting all along. 
the angels, the cloud of witnesses of people of faith, if they have any view of our world, which I'm not sure, because if you're in heaven and you have joy all the time, I don't know if you want to be watching episodes of what's going on down here. You know what I mean? Flip that channel. Oh, let's get back to Hosanna in the highest with the palm branch. What's on channel California? Whoa! <laughs> I'm, I'm in California too, so I can say that joke. Whatever. Wisconsin, whoa! All right. Uh, so, oh, I didn't even know I had Idaho channel. Idaho's on here? Oh. Uh, will you allow God to tag in whatever it is. How to live a hope-filled life. Recognize your brokenness. Realize God is with you. Wrestle with God as long as it takes. Wrestle with God as long as it takes. There's no time limit on wrestling with God. Wrestle with God till he blesses you. Wrestle with God till you have some semblance of an answer, till you get the wisdom you need, till you get the knowledge you need, till you get the understanding you need, till you get the forgiveness you need, till you get the patience you need, till you get the gentleness you need, till you get the truth that you need. Wrestle with God. Wrestle with God. Wrestle with God as long as it takes. Um, sisters and brothers, I know people of faith who have given up. The youth pastor that took me under his wing when I came to Christ as a teenager no longer is a Christian. He was a youth pastor at my church in South Minneapolis. He would pick me and some of my friends up on Tuesdays after school and, and he took us to Burger King, and I don't know how he got him. He must have knew the manager. He had these free Whopper cards. That was the incentive. He'd pick us up after school on Tuesdays. We'd go to Burger King. We all got a free Whopper, and then we went through the Gospels. Then he started taking us through books like Romans and Ephesians. I was like, man, I'm 16. <laughs> We're going through Romans and Ephesians, talking about justification, talking about that the, the righteousness, not from the law, but through faith in Jesus. That man who loved on me, when Danish and I started dating, he, he made me break up with somebody I was dating that was not a Christian. I mean, he, 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 I mean, he encouraged me strongly. <laughs> and soon after that, I met Danisha. I wanted to take Danisha to prom, but I didn't have a driver's license. And, and, and so... He took me out on his car, taught me how to drive, and was with me when I, when I went and I, and I received my driver's license. That man who took me through the Gospels, took me through Ephesians and Romans, prayed with me, taught me how to drive, is no longer, he, he, he is publicly, nationally known as a humanist, has a podcast, He's, I mean, he's with the same energy. He calls himself a humanist evangelist. I, I still love him dearly, praying for him. We, we, we had breakfast one time, and he was, he was telling me, and he, he said this publicly, so I'm not saying anything he hasn't said through his podcast or stuff. He was like, you know, how did he become, how did he give up hope? How, how did he become a humanist? He was like, well, I was riding my bike one day, and he, and he was hit by a car. And, and then he blacked out, and he, he could have died, and he woke up in the hospital, and he just said to me, when I woke up, I was looking in this hospital room, and he said, I just thought to myself, if I hadn't woke up, what would have happened? And I don't know why he came to this conclusion, but he said, nothing. I just wouldn't have woke up. He said, so my hope is in the fact that I'm still alive, and I woke up. But he said, but if I would have not woken up, that just would have been it. And I was like, I, I, I was still trying to understand why just that in and of itself was enough for him to say, I'm done with Jesus, I'm done with God, I'm a humanist now. Uh, maybe there were some other issues beyond that. The, the person who introduced me to him was a friend of mine that I went to high school with 
that he's actually the one that sat next to me on the bus and talked to me about Jesus. And when I said, I already go to church, he said, I'm not talking to you about church. I'm talking to you about Jesus. He was sitting next to me in the cafeteria. Um, he, He led me to Christ and about 23 other students in our high school. He he made it so that we could get our lunch on Wednesdays at our high school and we could go to the choir room and we could study the Bible and pray together. He doesn't follow Jesus anymore. He's given up hope. He's thrown in the towel. I'm not saying this to to, to make fun of these guys, to to, to shame them. I I, I love them. I pray for them. I, I, I desire their return to the hope of Jesus Christ. But it did make me think about why is it I haven't given up hope in Jesus yet. As messed up as the world is, with all the things I've gone through in life, with everything I see on cable news, why have I, with the things I've seen in church, oh man, there's no hurt like church hurt. It's a unique, distinctive kind of pain. If you've ever been deceived by a pastor, if you've ever been deceived by people that said they love Jesus, if you've ever had your heart broke by somebody that reads the Bible and pray before they eat, and there's a distinctive, unique pain when your heart is broken by somebody who claims Jesus. And yet with all that, I have not given up hope on Jesus. Why? I was, like, I was, like, why? I was thinking about this um, I, I, I met some, uh, a dear brother and a dear sister last night at, at the cookout on the field uh, from Kenya. And, uh, and I, I've been to Kenya uh, once. Uh, uh, Nairobi is beautiful. Like Sometimes people paint these images of the continent of Africa, but then they talk about Italy and Greece and Maui. Like They're beautiful, but then they, they think Africa. I'm telling you, some of the most stunning, beautiful views, some of the most amazing sunrises I've ever experienced were in Nairobi, in Kenya, on safari, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, and my wife, Denise, and I, last year, we went to Ghana, for the first time. And and while we were there, we uh, stood in a slave dungeon. And uh, while we were standing there, uh, the guide was telling us, and uh, I didn't realize this recently, that at least one third of the enslaved Africans that were brought here into slavery uh, in the United States, one third of them were Christian. And we know this now just from uh, stories, like once they learned English and they started, like some of them, before Jesus was shared with them, they were asking in their own language when they had children for their children to be baptized in Jesus' name. So one third, not all of them, but one third were Christian that came here. So think about this for a minute. So uh, let's say this one third who already believed in Jesus, they are captured in their communities and they are shackled and they have a two month journey walking in shackles, single file to this place called the river of the last bath. This is where they get a last bath in a river that's not all that clean before they are put on auction blocks to be sold as slaves once they are bought. Then if they survived all that, then they are now in a slave dungeon for three to four months. A third of them are Christian. They did, and they're. And can you can you imagine believing in Jesus and being shackled and in a slave dungeon on top of other people with no sanitary stuff? And you're there for three to four months in the darkness with people that don't speak the same language as you. You're crying out to Jesus. You're crying out. You're with all you got. You're asking Jesus for freedom. It ain't coming. Three to four months. Then you go through what's called a door no return. We stood there. You're put on a slave ship two to three months on the bottom of a slave ship. You believe in Jesus. You're crying out to Jesus. Matter of fact, one of the slave ships was called Jesus. You're crying out to God with all you got. Nothing's changing. You're brought to the United States. You finally go where you're going to go and you're a slave. And I can trace on my mom's side, my family all the way back to a freed girl named Jenny who came out of slavery on my mom's side of the family. And 
so, but she had faith. She believed in Jesus. So I'm thinking there were people, they were Christian, they were captured, they went into the river of the last bath, they went to the slave dungeon, they went to the slave ship, they survived. They didn't stop believing in Jesus. They kept talking about Jesus. They begged for their kids to be baptized in Jesus' name, and their kids were a slave, and those kids were a slave, but they kept worshiping. They snuck out in the middle of the night, and they worshiped Jesus. They learned to read the Bible in English without really being taught English. It was miraculous, and they kept their faith, and then they lived through Jim Crow. Then my dad left Monroe, Louisiana in the 1960s early, still seeing a a colored-only section and a white-only section. He had never experienced anything that was equal or integrated till he made his way to Minneapolis, but he met my mom. They never lost their faith. I'm thinking if all those people can live through all of that and still believe in Jesus, still believe in love, still believe in prayer, still believe in worship, then I can stand on their shoulders and still have hope in Jesus. And if you think that story is amazing, as amazing as that sounds, it is still not as amazing as what they did to Jesus. When you think of what they did to the body of Jesus Christ, and he didn't give up hope. Truly God and truly man, he laid on the cross and he died the most humiliating death you can experience for me and you. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. Don't give up your joy. Don't lose your encouragement. Pass it down to your children. Pass it down to your grandchildren. I'm encouraging you as you start this week, as you play with your kids, as you get time away from them. Yes, take them! (laughs) As you sit in the dining hall, as you walk a trail, as you ride the train into Santa Cruz, as you look at the ocean, I'm encouraging you this week, find your joy, find your peace, find God's truth, and regain your hope.